Welcome everyone to Thursday, Australia's at home. Um, we're still at home. Um, as we do every day, we just want to recognise that wherever we are in Australia, we're on Indigenous lands. Um, I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, and I know that you're all on different lands and we all pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging and recognise the land was never ceded. We're not actually all on Indigenous land today. Sharon Burrow, our good friend and head of the Global Union International Trade Union Congress has got herself up at, I think, 4am to join us. And she's going to be involved in a discussion we're having today about some of the global perspectives around this unprecedented crisis. And it's you know, quite inspiring to have someone like Sharon, who leads the global union movement, and many of you would have got to know Sharon in her time as ACTU president. And the work she does on a global scale, I find mind boggling. And if we're trying to get our head around what's happening in our own backyard to try to make sense of this world, this world catastrophe is, is just something else again. So I think it's going to be a great discussion with her. We're also going to be joined by Phil Ireland, who's another Australian with global responsibility. He runs the, um, the ITUC of GetUps. Um, so all the, the digital um, campaigning agencies around the world have a peak body as well. So Phil's going to be part of the discussion as well. And of course, we want all you to be part of the discussion as well. Um, for those that are joining us for the first time, Australia at Home is an attempt to create a bit of structure in these strange times and have a place where civil society and people that are interested in ideas can come together to, to hear from people that are totally across the issue, but also sharing the ideas so that we're all getting a bigger view of, of what's going on. And as every day, the rules are pretty simple. Um, use the chat firstly to introduce yourself and then to ask questions of our participants as we go along. Um, secondly, to, to shift your view, if you can, to gallery, which is the little squares in your top right-hand corner. Turn your camera on if you can, because um, it's nice to see the faces of everybody who is in the room. And thirdly, just to let you know, we record these pieces and put them up um, online later. So please keep everything nice, as I'm sure you will. So um, on that note, um, our... This, this, I don't even know how you describe this, but you, you are our longest distance guest so far in our first month, Sharon. And um, I do want to welcome you and thank you for getting up so early and for all the work you're doing. But I also want to start off by asking you the question that we ask all our guests every day, which is, how are you going? Well, I'm healthy. That's, thank, thankfully, that's the case. And, uh, but of course, all our staff are uh, in lockdown, as you are. We're working... Uh, remotely. I have to say the intensity of telework in a crisis like this, I think any time, but in a crisis like this actually uh, probably um, undermines the romance of everybody wanting to work from home. <laughs> and uh, certainly from my perspective, I can't wait to get back to a real life. Now, my colleagues would say that means I can't wait till the, my favourite wine bar is open, but, you know, that too. <laughs> So what's the challenge of being, I know you spend most of your time travelling around the globe and being on the ground in different countries and seeing the experience of working people. How's it been trying to get a helicopter view when you're very much rooted to your little flat in Brussels? Actually, everybody's very focused on reporting in. So we've conducted now uh, two global surveys. The third one will go out Monday. And in addition to that, uh, numerous uh, uh, country case studies as we build a case for, you know, the humanitarian support and the building of social protection, so vital to stop, you know, the now the risk of destitution and uh, starvation in many, many countries. And so, ironically, we have more data than, than normal. And tomorrow I'm going to start again what I normally do, which is hold workers' hearings wherever I am, just do them virtually. And so, in a way, it's taught all of us that we are so connected. It is a family of trade unions that when a crisis like this ha happens, the, the global sphere doesn't divide you. It actually can still connect you, whether you're there physically or not. 
hugely intense though and hugely devastating to hear the the stories of destitution and fear and not be there physically to comfort people so i know this is really a difficult question but i'm really interested in your 360 view of how the world's coping and where things are being done well and where you are really really worried that things are just not being handled well so if you think about 80 percent of the world's workforce now being in isolation then what that requires is of course uh, you know for workers on the front lines who we are depending on to save our lives even though we're in isolation the risk for of in health and safety just the devastating uh, inadequacy of provision of uh, protective equipment for all frontline workers has been an absolute uh, disaster. If you take a look at the global supply chains, we've been, first of all, the first wave was that it was fine for governments to shut down borders, but nobody thought about how you kept essential supplies running. So now at least there's a global awareness, there are green lanes, so you know, I'm not so worried about that anymore. What I'm now absolutely panicked about is two things. One is that if you have 57% uh, of governments in Africa and 35% in the Americas who haven't actually provided any income support, then there's only one answer to that. And it's a devastation that's even deeper than the fact that in the Asia Pacific, where governments have provided some protection, 64% say it's not enough to cover basic needs. So for those people with no support at all, then the, uh, the future is simply about destitution or starvation. And so unless we get that massive humanitarian supporting now, and just to make it even bleaker, as we saw the disasters of things like fires and floods in Australia, um, for all of you, if you think about adding to the risk of starvation, the crops now being destroyed by locusts, giant locusts in East Africa, plagues of locusts, then we will face, uh, you know, not just a global humanitarian disaster that's bigger than the depression, but also one on a potentially global scale that uh, represents some of the famines of Africa in the 80s. I'm not painting a pretty picture because it isn't pretty. And one of the things we now need to see is uh, beyond government support for workers is in developed countries, is social protection for the world's poor because only 29% of people are covered by adequate social protection. The world's promised these people for decades, but the UN made a united promise to social protection clause almost 10 years ago. Now we have to deliver. And that will take a level of global solidarity that is emerging, even despite the nationalistic retreat of uh, just looking after, you know, our own citizens in our own countries. And I want to look into the global, um, what, what this means for globalisation a little bit further into the conversation. But just on that, that issue of humanitarian disasters, now normally when this sort of thing occurs, the call comes out to the wealthy Western nations to, to share their abundance. This will be a different conversation this time, won't it? It certainly will, but we still have to share. The world is a very wealthy place and it's actually three times wealthier in just the last 20 years. And yet we are reaping the, the shocking nature of uh, inequality and the constraints on developing in, uh, development in the developing world versus the 1% in, in the developed economies. So you still have no excuse. I mean, at one level, you can be very positive and say, we are one world. If you look at the measures around the world, this is the greatest act of solidarity we've ever seen. People actually choosing to give up liberty to stay safe and support the safety of others. What we need to see in a broken global system of multilateralism now is people say, it's not a time to worry about what money we have or don't have. It's a time to share because otherwise we are going to see people dying in numbers that should never happen in such a wealthy world. 
And we're talking numbers that, you know, you saw um, the giant numbers, of course, of, of previous epidemics, the most uh, recent dramatic one being the Spanish flu after, of course, uh, the World Wars, but there's um, uh, World War One. but there's no doubt that this could be on a scale and it could keep reoccurring. The WHO experts that we talk to every other day, it seems, say that, first of all, this could be a wave as it goes in the cold weather down to the south and then back up to the north. So even when we start to flatten the curve, as they call it, and things start to return to normal, no one can assume that if we don't act as a world now, that we're going to be protected in the future. And, and just one last bit on, in terms of the 360. Which areas or regions are you particularly concerned about that we may be in our sort of self-obsession missing out on in a place like Australia? Oh, Africa, definitely. Parts of Latin America. You know, the Asia Pacific will have areas that are devastated, but it's in a development phase where, and it's much quicker. And I saw the great solidarity coming out of Australia helping the Pacific in the last 24 hours or so and calling for support for the Pacific. I'm really panicked about parts of Africa, really, really panicked because, you know, it's to, to talk to union leaders there is just heartbreaking. And of course, you know, just even in a country like Nigeria, which is in fact probably the wealthiest, it probably is the 20th wealthiest country in the world, but with extraordinary poverty. They've delivered, you know, uh, just last week, 500,000 food packages. That's not enough. You know, in India, you know, the government at least has systems and they have, uh, despite what I might say about that, that government, some of the states have actually done amazing things. So if you go to Kerala, it's being managed much better than it is in other parts of India. But you can't get to people unless, uh, even with income transfers, if they don't have bank accounts. And so consequently, it comes down to literally delivering food and water packages. And in a lockdown, you know, volunteers are everywhere, frankly, and they're brave and they're heroic. And, you know, we're all incredibly in awe of their courage. But you know, if the food's not there and the people aren't there and the system's not there because everybody else is coping with the fear of, uh, of dying from the disease, then just think about that. So definitely come to Pakistan, absolutely. Mini India, but much poorer. Really worried about Pakistan. But I still think the Asia Pacific has a solidarity generally that might see us be able to, uh, to support the necessary actions there. But if you think of the potential for collapsing health systems in Africa, along with the risk of starvation, certainly destitution, we're not coming back from this quickly. Phil, I might bring you into the discussion and thanks for those opening comments, Sharon. Phil, are you getting the same sort of intelligence from your networks in terms of the, the sort of the universal experience, but obviously very different um, intensity of the impact in different parts of the world. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I think something we can often miss here in Australia is that coming into this crisis, the world was already at a pretty tough place in terms of freedom and democracy around the world. Um, I was going to read a quote, but I'll just, I won't read the quote. I'm just going to advise you should check out a report from Freedom House last year, which um, showed 2019 was the 14th consecutive year of declining civil rights and liberties and democracy. It outlined oppression against ethnic minorities, religious minorities, um, authoritarian states, trying new things to curtail civil action and also monitor their um, populations. And that was last year. So we're going into this year and this crisis from a pretty challenging and troubling foundation. So what we're seeing now is obviously we have nation states curtailing civil liberties, rolling out mass surveillance, executives extending their power and minorities being 
um, oppressed. And I don't think, because we're so caught up in the numbers here, understandably, and health systems, there's, there's things happening every day. For example, Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel um, closed down the courts at 1 a.m. on the day his trial into fraud and corruption was set to begin. And he did that because of uh, coronavirus and not wanting the courts to open. Um, Viktor Orban in Hungary has uh, essentially consolidated executive power and is now governing by executive decree. And, and Hungary might seem a long way off, but don't forget it was Viktor Orban that hosted Tony Abbott recently as a, as a keynote speaker to the Hungarian parliament. The, the far right around the world are coordinating. I could, I could list off 20 examples of how different countries are suppressing the media, are suppressing civil liberties, are using this moment to continue problematic and authoritarian agendas that they were already pursuing, but they're now ramping up. And that doesn't even begin to look at Africa where Sharon's sort of flagged particular concerns. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we don't have, well, we have a group in South Africa, but not in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, I think, I mean, recently we've, in India, there's been a, a lot of um, religious persecution of Muslims in recent days. And now there's misinformation about Muslims being the cause of the pandemic in India. And so the oppression of those minorities in India is escalating in the context of, of this crisis. So do you have, and I guess for both of you, this is a question, is it possible to have a global concept of this or is it more that we have to look locally and then look at local cultures and political systems because it's all going to be operating at different paces and different levels of intensity? I think you have to do both. I mean, Phil's right that we went into this with a world that was vastly unequal, had a climate emergency, had the risk and opportunities from technology, none of which had been dealt with. And I mean, he talked about the oppression and we've seen it in Poland, Hungary and other places, but we've also seen it in India. He's right, India's a fascist state by and large now. And, uh, and so our, our global polling has shown that more than 50 countries have simply closed down civic space to the point where the restrictions are enormous. And even through this crisis, there are, there are, believe it or not, even though there's been unprecedented, unprecedented unity with the, what I would call the decent business community, because we're all in this together, I mean, the non-essential supply chains are collapsing. So I spent till late last night negotiating a framework to get help into the textile sector, largely through Asia Pacific, but also into parts of Africa and Latin America. And so if you think about that context, and now add this to it, there are still bastard bosses out there. That's not very nice, is it? But nevertheless, it's true. Actually still saying to governments like Poland, like Hungary, like India and others, close down labour rights. I mean, even in Israel, despite the packages being not too bad, the Palestinians are still being excluded and we're fighting to get money for the displaced Palestinian workers from Israeli workplaces. And despite a, an incredibly strong union movement actually in Israel, they actually allowed 14 hour days. So, you know, like there are strange areas and we are very worried about surveillance, Phil must be too, because, okay, as I said, people are very, very uh, accommodating of the situation right now, but we're gonna come out of this with both, uh, you know, those, uh, those authoritarian governments, the far right, actually seeing this as a championship and championing a more conservative society, big risk. And secondly, the level of surveillance for not just workplaces, but communities is something we're all gonna to have to talk about. What's the balance there of protection and oppression? If, if I could jump in as well on that, Peter. Thanks, Sharon. I completely agree with what you're saying. And I feel, I feel less, um, pessimistic about local scale action. I think communities are coming together. I think people intuitively know how to do that. The thing that really worries me is, is our supranational and transnational and intergovernmental structures. They are now more important than ever. Um, viruses don't respect boundaries. The climate crisis no. doesn't respect boundaries. 
Um, ocean pollution doesn't respect boundaries. The weaponization of space doesn't respect boundaries. And what has really been shown in the past couple of months is that our transnational institutions are weaker than they need to be. The European Union has moved too slowly and clearly isn't fit for purpose for this type of crisis. Um, there, are, there are similar critiques of both the United Nations and the World Health Organization. But, but the answer isn't to, to withdraw um, from these institutions. The answer is to invest in them and make them better because we cannot... And, re and reform them, Phil. Let's Absolutely. use it to reform multilateralism, which was in crisis. I might, I might say, uh, Peter, on your global national piece, you got to remember this, in 2008-9, the crisis grew out of the financial sector and impacted on the real economy. This has grown out of people's, uh, you know, attacks on the health of individuals. So it's started in the real economy and grown now into a global dilemma. Mm. One great piece of news, though, let me pick people's spirits up. For all those campaigners, many of them in Australia, who campaigned for debt relief for, I don't know, 30 years, in my experience, and, and longer, last night we got a, a decision out of the G20 finance ministers with a few champions out of Europe like Macron and others who that saw for the first time debt relief for 12 months, but debt relief along with emergency funds into the poorest countries. Now, you know, you'll come back to the multilateral system, I know more broadly, but you have to do both is the answer. We have to invest in reform of multilateralism for people this time and for a more balanced world. And we have to also look at a more balanced approach to trade nationally. It's not protectionism. It's about how you actually never get into a situation like this again where people can't get emergency supplies. Thanks both. I'm going to call on a few questions from the room now, if that's okay. Um, firstly, is Eleanor able to put her question to you, Sharon? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Thanks. Sharon, um, my question is around, so I've heard some sort of horror stories, particularly in um, Cambodia and Bangladesh, where textile workers are having to complete work, but the companies have pulled out and aren't paying for completed um, products. And it just sort of got me thinking that the supply, the, the demand side of fast fashion is grinding to a halt very quickly. And I'm thinking about the fact that we haven't sort of sustainably supported those markets and sustainably pulled out. Um, and I'm just wondering, as a consumer, I'm not a big fan of the idea of ethical consumerism, but I'm just wondering what we can do to show solidarity to particularly those garment workers as the demand of those really fragile uh, supply chains run to a halt. And again, this, it's, a, it's a brilliant question because while it's not just textiles, it's, it's all non-essential supply chains where the model has been a model of labour arbitrage, you know, cheap labour, no rights, no protections, no social protection. And uh, really, really dehumanising exploitation. I've walked those supply chains. And so the irony is having fought to clean them up with many millions of people around the world for decades, we are now there trying to defend the sustainability of, uh, of income and jobs so that if and when the economy comes back in some form, then, you know, those people haven't been lost to destitution. So the textile industry is a good example, although let me say it's even worse in places like horticulture and others where it's just collapsed totally. So when you look at Bangladesh, let's take that as an example, although I was talking to a manufacturer yesterday from Ca Cambodia and he was pleading for exactly what you said, the brands to pay at least the, or the contractual orders as they, uh, they are legally uh, bound to. So it's an, in an ironic and unprecedented solidarity, what we are trying to do is 
recognize as much as it galls us that many of the global brands are cash strapped. They can't, they can't, their stores aren't open, they've got no cash flow. They're not, a few might be, but they're not actually at risk of collapse. But we need to get them low or no interest loans to pay the contracts and, and therefore sustain the workers through that period you've just described. And you're talking three to four million workers in Bangladesh alone, and the wage bill there is actually easily coverable from global funds. It's 409 million a month, I think. So the statement that hopefully we finalised last night with Industrial um, actually will give us, with employers and with uh, NGOs, the capacity do a couple of things. One is to say the European model, which has now been approved, where businesses can get uh, low or no loans to support business continuity, but also the incomes of workers. We want that to be extended to the companies for, uh, for businesses outside of Europe. We need to set up some similar demands in the US. But then we need some urgent funds to just go directly, of course, to the factories as well. It's complex and it's a tough call, but unless we do it again, and it won't just be in that sector, again, you know, with a, a world that's not going to come back to full speed for goodness knows how long, then we will see again, just again, that slump in humanitarian confidence and so, and the potential for disaster. And so, hence again, an absolute need for a global social protection fund. I'm going to keep saying that to everybody until we understand that unless we, we, and I know there are deficiencies in Australia, and I know you've fought so hard to get proper income support, and I'm so proud of the, the ACTU and all of the activists there, although you still have exclusions, but it's a great thing, except that's not available to uh, to seventy uh, percent of the world's people, and we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. We're going to run a couple of other questions. Sarah Rogan from Oxfam has just put in the chat a link to a campaign Oxfam's running um, around these exact issues you've just been talking about in terms of guaranteeing existing contracts in the textile sector, Sharon. But we had Kelly Shea with a question for Phil. Well, hi everybody. Um, uh, greetings from Melbourne. Um, I had a question, Phil. Australia come into um, into this crisis with a higher level of privilege, I think, than many other countries have. We've had 29 years of no recession, unemployment's relatively low. Absolutely, we have our issues, but um, we also have a level of, um, I think, affluence that affords us an opportunity out of the crisis. Um, Maxi, uh, Dr. Um, Maria Maxi wrote an article recently about um, whether we can use this crisis to create decent digi jobs um, and whether you think um, countries like Australia have an obligation to lead that work um, and lead that organising for um, uh, really, really um, vulnerable workers who are doing all of the different work that you do. So I'm interested in your perspective on on that and what are the opportunities that come out of this crisis for particularly for um for, for digital workers it's a great question um i i work mainly in the sector of digital workers who do campaigning and advocacy um so my initial response is that yes workforces and jobs need to reform and change and evolve to meet the new crisis and this is a great opportunity for new digital jobs. I'd say in my sector, and this is similar to another question I saw on the thread, is that there's this, out of this crisis, uh, we do have an opportunity to develop our campaigning and our advocacy um, even further than we have. And there are lots, pe people are assuming they can't campaign now, but that's not actually true. Through, through digital means, we can do a whole range of things from from our own homes and those things, organizations like Get Up in Australia or MoveOn.org in the US all have employees and massive teams that help run that as well. So I'd, I'd say yes. And I think we need to be thinking, particularly on the progressive side of politics, we need to be thinking creatively about the types of jobs and roles and organizations we can 
create and develop so that we see a better world coming out of this from everything from addressing subsidies to fossil fuels, um, dare I say, through to campaigning for a better social safety net around the world, like Sharon mentioned, and a range of other things. Just one more question before we move on with the um, discussion. Sean had a question. Um, so if you can bring him up. Hi. Um, interestingly, uh, we know that all, pretty much all novel viruses come from uh, animals, uh, otherwise they wouldn't be novel. And um, whether what particular market, whatever it came from is, is not really the point. Um, we know that we've had swine flu, lots of other versions of flu. We also know that meat is an incredibly destructive uh, industry worldwide, both in terms of environmental impact and of course, animal cruelty. Um, and we also know that in many places, meat is subsidized. Um, and we also know that import and export of live animals is never uh, acceptable. I just wonder in this new world, the post COVID world, if we can seriously move towards, uh, I wouldn't say a vegan world at all. I don't think that's reasonable or appropriate. And apart from um, humanitarian purposes, uh, no meat moving across borders, no subsidies, and let meat actually really cost its real price. I don't know if anyone wants to contribute that, or take that. Is that to me or to Phil? Look, I think, it's somebody, let's put this in a broader context, but somebody said, you know, when I said come back to speed, shouldn't we be talking about a reformed world? Hell yes. Like, you know, recovery, reconstruction and resilience should frame the way we think about this crisis and a lot of things need to change. But, but one of the things we can't uh, change is the reality that full employment Employment's still the basis of our societies and full employment and the taxes it generates uh, from both workers and companies is the basis on which we have things like universal social protection. So we want the world to be different. We want the world to understand that full employment in some form. Now that will hopefully be reduced working hours with, uh, you know, maintenance of, of income at uh, living wage levels and, of course, collectively bargained outcomes. So we are very ambitious about change. But I also want people to understand, in the context of that question, I think the world is moving to be um, more thoughtful about uh, consuming, you know, less meat and other things. But I always worry it's like the imposition of saying we have to stop consumerism. Well, yes, for whom? Because when you are starving, then frankly, whether it's meat or vegetables or whatever, anything people can get to survive is going to be eaten. So I'm not one who, you know, I'm a climate warrior, but I'm not one who wants to impose people's, um, you know, habits around food and and uh, and lifestyle. I think you have to do that through education and consciousness. And, uh, you know, and we're going to have, we're approaching planetary boundaries that will mean we'll have less of everything if we don't actually sustain ourselves. And the other question that was asked, Peter, and it's a really good one, it's been around for a while, is should UBI be the answer? Well, you know, I'm actually pretty tough about this. Social protection has a basic income. It's called unemployment benefits, pension, um, elements of uh, paid leave like maternity protection and so on. And so the fight around New Start, terrible name, in Australia has actually been one about a, a ba an income on which people can live with dignity and the levels of that. I've never understood why you would want to give everybody a basic income if they actually had a job like mine where I earn a good income and other people's and yet we would be paid by the state extra money when people are in desperate circumstances. So basic income, yes, as part of a social protection system, we will fight forever for that. It's so always been trade union demands. So let's dig a bit deeper and, and thanks for your question, Sean. There's a whole... Um, discussion tomorrow on food with um, Daniel Stone and a bunch of people. So maybe we can um, 
dig a bit deeper onto some of those ideas tomorrow. And I did take your point in the chat that you weren't talking about banning meat. It was just about rethinking the way we no, no. take food. And, so thanks and for it's that. a good question because it's actually part of a debate we have to have. And, uh, and so the food supply has already been changing dramatically and will change dramatically. So it's a very good debate. I, and I appreciate that we just can't impose you know, kind of lifestyles on people. We never have been able to, never will be able to, but we can educate. Yeah. So let's talk about um, the piece you posted on Medium, which has got really strong take up globally about the notion of really the, the, the answer to our problem is already here in the Global Development Goals. Um, I guess my question is, how can you operationally get to the point like so how's it going to be paid for how's it going to be implemented particularly when we live in a world of national governments not global frameworks well there's no doubt that uh you know multilateralism has been in crisis and it's been in crisis because of the model what what the world did in 2015 with the, so the sustainable development goals and the climate agreement was actually agree to a zero poverty, zero carbon world. And when you look now at the SDGs that for us really stack up in this crisis, if we're gonna do something about women, we haven't talked about women, for example, but uh, women are the untold victims of this crisis on many, many levels, on the majority of the informal economy, you know, on the front line, 70% of health workers, the majority of front lines in in retail and services, 53% in services actually, of the global workforce. And then there's all the care workers who aren't recognised at all, domestic workers in the informal economy and many, many others. But if you're going to do something about those, uh, the risk of, um, you know, further inequality, millions will be thrown back into poverty. Goal one is where social protection actually sits. Health is goal three. And 3.8, I think, don't quote me on that uh, sub number, but, but in fact, free uh, or universal access to free health is part of the world's ambition. And the fact that we failed to do that excludes people from healthcare at a vital time or the cuts that austerity is driven through our health systems because of increasingly a transfer of money away from public services is uh, simply got to be reversed. And then you look at goal uh, eight, or goal five, which is gender equality. Goal eight, which is in fact uh, decent work, full employment and decent work. Now, full employment could mean that we're actually working many less hours, but if everybody doesn't have a, a, a decent employment opportunity, should they choose to work, then we're actually excluding people everywhere. And that forces you back into those unsustainable models of informal workers and so on. And I might add, the, the governments, it's not just national governments, local governments, national governments have failed to regulate the global labour market. 60% informal, but it includes all the platform workers. The freelancers are actually dependent, you know, on one or, one or two employers. The so-called independent contract has been a fight of the union movement forever. And... Uh, and so this has to be revisited. So those goals, plus the sustainability goals, of course, uh, are a framework, they're a roadmap. Now, but, can but we- But how do you get there? How do you get there? Well, can we use the power of people? You know, we talk about building workers' power, but Phil is also an activist in building the power of, of people. And, you know, can we build the power of people to demand that that's how our governments behave? We have a whole, reframing. We need a new social contract. We, of course, need uh, now that in the context of recovery, reconstruction, resilience, that deals with the convergent crisis. We can't give up on the climate emergency, even if we deal, even as we deal with the humanitarian issues. But we also uh, need uh, to reform democracies because people have just lost trust in democracy. So we say there's a lot of talk from really good small countries like New Zealand and others about shifting to a wellness budget. We value that. We think that's a bit soft in language terms, not in action. So we want to see beyond GDP. 
And now it shows you why. If governments aren't actually governing with accountability for living standards, for full employment, for rights, and indeed for, uh, um, you know, with the basis of just ta taxation and so on, but also with participative democracy capacity, we're never going to rebuild trust in democracy. So now's the time to expose this, get those reforms multilaterally, but also get them in our own democracies. Phil, do you want to weigh in there? Like, where do you see these issues being in your hierarchy of activism for your organisations? So I think the challenge we're facing at this moment in time is that we know... We know the tactics, the short-term tactics and strategies we need to be employing in the short term. We need to be making sure recovery packages are equitable and, and inclusive. Um, we need to be making sure that our transition to a clean, green, renewable energy system isn't curtailed. We need to make sure there aren't new subsidies for, um, for industries that are a net bad on the earth, like the fossil fuel sector. So I think our challenge is thinking about those medium and longer term strategies and tactics. And one of those is around multilateralism. And I don't, I, I think no one really knows what this is going to look like next year. And it's quite hard to know at this stage, what the exact mechanisms and levers to interact with those systems are. But what I, what I can say, and this goes back to something Sharon said is that right now we need to be building the people power to be able to respond to those moments. We need connected communities that can respond in rapid and nimble ways to challenges as they emerge, be they an international trade negotiation, a, a new multilateral negotiation, or, or responding to the, to the threat of conflict based on a country taking advantage of this moment to annex territory. And, and in this moment where everyone can feel quite powerless and governments are undoubtedly moving more towards authoritarian and totalitarian um, uh, systems, governments, even authoritarian leaders, still want to be popular. And people power and pressure from the public still works. Um, it works just as, I would say, just as well in democratic countries like Australia as it does in semi-democratic countries like Poland or Hungary. The only problem, Phil, is that over the last decade we've been losing everywhere. Not on everything. On most uh, things. We, we, got the, we got the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, some countries have made a whole lot of progress. In fact, I think just a couple of hours ago, we saw in South Korea, for the first time in 16 years, left-leaning parties have secured a parliamentary majority. Uh, and that's partly due to the fact that South Koreans expressed support for Mr. Moon's government uh, to bring the epidemic under control. If you look at the leaders who are being put up now as um, global examples, you look at Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, a strong progressive leader that will probably win re-election and has a lot of influence. I, I think if you look, there are lots of examples of victories and how we get victories. We had the glass half full there. Are you, you, you half full no, at the I moment, love, Sharon? I love the, I love the optimism. There is yeah. optimism in the world and it is, feels right. It is bought about from people. I mean, just on the democracy front, I was smiling because I was thinking about the joy in Somalia where they're running a campaign that we're backing, uh, um, you know, 100% called Let, Let Somalia Vote. And they look like, I'm not sure what this impact will have, but they look like having elections in the first time for 50 years with universal suffrage next year. Small, small thing. But people are at the heart of that. There are really, really progressive leaders around. As a glo uh, uh, the progressive governments have lost trust of people globally, no question about that. There is a, a bit of a swing back, but again, you know, they have to learn again how to talk to people and have to genuinely learn how to put people first in the context of their policies. There's only one country in the world, for example, that has recognised that for the purpose of this crisis, migrant workers have to be have access to this same support from government as, uh, as citizens or residents, and that's Portugal. And Portugal came to its own disaster 
coming out of the 2008-9 crisis and the slap on austerity from, from Europe. So, you know, I could tell you about the positive spots, but I can also say to you, unless we have the power of people behind democratic values, behind global reform, and that we don't retreat into a nationalist view, like I think we have to have a much more shared approach to globalisation, but if we just retreat into, uh, into our own kind of self-interest, then we won't solve these problems. You can't solve a climate problem on your own. You can't solve global inequality, which is actually a risk to national economies on your own. You can't actually have a world, you can have much more balanced trade, but you can't have a world without some trade. It's not possible. We've always had global trade. It just has to be fair trade. And, uh, and I could go on, I won't. But, you know, we are at a point where we didn't see the outcome of the 8-9 crisis result in the kind of reforms we wanted. We did see the rise of the right still there. The risk is incredible, you know, fascism sweeping still across huge parts of Europe as well as other parts of the world. Bolsonaro actually denies that this crisis exists, that uh, he thinks the, the virus is fake news. And of course, Brazil, you know, amazing op optimistic country under Lula now. I mean, and then there are strange patches, Peter, like, you know, we've been fighting a battle in the Gulf states for rights for workers with many other organisations. And, you know, if you'd listen to the Saudi finance minister in, uh, you know, leading the press conference yesterday and thought, you know, even 12 months ago, they would not have been as open. And I'm hopefully still, we're still on track in Saudi to have, uh, you know, registered unions within months. It's a promise, the legislation's in draft. Who knows? These are not democratic countries, but Phil's right. People can still change their future. The last topic before I open up to a few final questions is really one that I'm still trying to get my head around, which is what likely emerges over the coming years is a rebuilding of national economies and probably a wind back of the notion of a global economy. So I think my question for both of you is, can that happen with still a global sense of movement? And if so, how? Yeah, no, I'm optimistic it can. You know, we talked about the textile sector and it wasn't perfect. And, you know, I can feel Michelle O'Neill saying to me, Sharon, there are all these problems with it. There were. But if you go back to a world where a, a good example was that people negotiated shared trade in textiles with a, a, an agreement called the MFA, most people wouldn't have known about it or, or uh, thought about it, but it was in fact quotas. It was a quota system about you know, what, where you could produce textiles and how much and so on, and it was negotiated. Now, it's not a perfect model, but you know, Trudeau said, you know, that, he's, that Canada's going to take back supply chains. Now, he didn't mean for everything, but he did mean for essential uh, equipment and products that never again will they get caught short of. And so, you know, we've seen more innovation in the last month from everything around pharmaceuticals through to protective equipment and, uh, and government uh, support than we've seen for years in terms of putting people first. So how do we get the balance is the question you're asking. And it has to be a balance. You know, I listen to people tell me that, um, you know, well, we'll all be back to normal and trade will come back. And I say, really? Not in the current form. We have to really have an open mind about what it will look like. Yeah, and from my perspective, I mean, I, I think the nature of trade will change in the coming years. But trade has, how humans trade has been changing for decades, hundreds of years. It's in a constant state of change and flux. And this is an opportunity to, to think about the type of tra trade we wanna have and how we want that to be regulated and treated. Um, I, I think we have, there are like very significant opportunities and challenges. I think one of the reasons I'm more hopeful about global trade than I am about other forms of multilateralism is that there is enormous, largely unregulated global capital behind it. 
um, a lot of very wealthy people and wealthy governments have a lot of interest in global trade routes staying open. And make no mistake, they will be taking this opportunity, many of them will be using this opportunity to further their wealth and probably create more inequality. So the, the fight that progressives are gonna have is going to be on every front. Um, and global capital at the moment doesn't, their interests don't often intersect with the interests of the majority and particularly workers who are at the bottom of their supply chains. I might call on Andrew Detmer, who I saw was in the room with a question a bit earlier that seems on topic at the moment. Uh, sure. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. G'day, Sharon. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Uh, um, so, as you expect, uh, there's always a, a great amount of uh, discussion papers and, you know, I mean, crises always beget uh, a lot of papers. Um, and, of course, we're doing quite a few in Australia. But are you aware of anything being done at an international level which we might be able to use uh, as some sort of uh, indicator, blueprint, uh, however is appropriate, and who it might be being generated by, or if, if not, should we really stick to our national stuff so that, uh, in, 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 until we've got to the point where uh, we've got that under control, flatten the curve as it were, and, uh, and then perhaps try and uh, meld a, uh, an international response? Well, it's, at, the, at the moment there's kind of, um, there's a lot of debate because if you look at the numbers in Sweden, it's not they don't have uh, cases, they do. It's not they don't have deaths, they do. But they are, in fact, less than right here in Belgium and certainly less than Italy and Spain and, and you know, the US, which is tragic. So they haven't locked down entirely. And so you, they have put social distancing rules in place and so on. So you have... People are looking at what works and what doesn't work. On the, on the worker support front, then there's no doubt that the bulk, there are some exceptions in Central and Eastern Europe, but the bulk of European packages have met the test, our tests, which were paid sick leave, wage support, income support, and um, because, in, because of the informal nature of workers, including, as I said, you know, in developed countries with platform work and so on, you have to have income support because it's not always wages and plus for other humanitarian reasons and, uh, and health and social protection. And we know that the bulk of those things have been met, even though austerity had taken some sway through. But beyond that, what's now really evident is that business itself, which you know, if it didn't mean workers, you might say, well, you know, you've realised you have to operate on a different model. But with the closing of business everywhere except for supermarkets who are doing very well and on the stock exchange, then, um, then you know, this is a disaster for everybody. And it's a, it's, a, it's a vicious circle in and of itself. So Europe's at least thoughtful about this, despite the fact that Peter said it earlier, I think, their initial response was national retreat, full stop. And it took three or four summit meetings to get some of the countries. And the last holdout was actually the Netherlands, where all our unions were saying you have to agree to a, to a European package as well as national package. If you go beyond that, the surprising response has been in the US because nothing to do with Trump, sadly, although now he wants his names on the checks. But, uh, unbelievable. But, you know, they, they're talking about support like public health, like income support you haven't seen in years. But I don't think there's anything different in the response, Andrew, to what you've done in Australia. And you've been one of, you were one of the countries we put up as the first 12 to set the high bar. I think you might have been the second wave, but anyway, to set the high bar. However, what we do need to do is collaborate around what recovery, reconstruction and resilience looks like because this, this makes the Marshall Plan, for all of you, uh, you know, history aficionados, look like a nice little, uh, you know, handout in terms of what we're going to need on a global scale, how you must reform Bretton Woods. So even as we were 
saying that debt relief was a priority. For example, Malpass, the American head now of the World Bank, was saying, yes, it will come with structural reform. Now, you remember the fight against structural reform in the 80s and 90s, austerity in this era. But, you know, I must say another woman, Kristalina, um, who heads up, the, is now the managing director of um, Shreshaba, who's head of the IMF. She's a much more human-focused leader. And she has brought a, a solidarity to these questions around what people and poor countries need that is, I think, remarkable. And I've spent some time talking to her. But she, um, uh, she's going to be thwarted if we can't shift the US this week just on special drawing rights. Now, you would know, Andrew, that we're not always a fan of special drawing rights because they use the liquidity into business. But in this case, the design of them, it, liquidity is desperate, but we want them to be transparent enough to see that they're going to the real economy. And there is a model of liquidity swaps which go into developing countries. So we are still interconnected. None of the best of the packages are different in elements in any significant way in response. But now we have to get the recovery issues really, really on the money because otherwise we will slip back into just a poorer world on business as usual. And that's where the Conservatives would take us. The far right wants to take us back to national retreat, you know, fear of others and, of course, uh, far more Conservative societies. Got time for one last question for both of you, but it'll have to be a, a, a quick instinctive response. And the question's from Joe, if you're still there, Joe. I am here. Um, thanks for a great call, everyone. Um, it was really just about what the everyday person can be doing to help shift the um, you know, shift shift things to a more equitable and sustainable society for us all. I'll jump in. I mean, obviously, there's all the standard answers. Join your union, get involved with good social, domestic social advocacy organisations like GetUp. Um, obviously, I have a conflict of interest there, but I think you should definitely sign up to GetUp. Uh, there's a whole range of other things, though. I think staying connected with your community um, is really important. I think sharing good information. There's a lot of misinformation out there in the in the Facebook bubble and the Instagram bubble and the WhatsApp bubble. Sharing good information, staying connected uh, and looking for new opportunities to engage. And, and I think also, I think we're going to need a lot of activists and people to be engaged in the coming months and years ahead. So looking after your own resilience and mental health. We just can't, we can't let us all burn out with despair at this point in time because heaven knows it's it's a, a trial to stay cooped up in our little home offices I, I think it's about raising your voice Peter and talking to each other and there's a you know one of the optimistic things is when we're sick to death of technology and no one more than me and I love to cook wants to go to some of my favorite restaurants but you know we talk a lot now on technology to friends and family as well as our work environment because we feel a need to be connected and that's also the conversation is around things that probably people have avoided for a long time because they were seen as political or they would cause arguments there is a solidarity that is extraordinary and so it's an educative uh, you know collective educative space right now and I think that can lead us to raising our voice, first of all, around a shared set of values and care and solidarity, and then around what action we want from that. So I think Phil's right. It's a time for people power. And as a trade unionist, we can build workers power with your support because it was your unions that fought for your packages. And the ACTU and the trade unions in Australia, you would expect me to say this, but I'm very proud of it. I'm also proud of Greg Combat. You know, he doesn't have any love loss with some of those uh, politicians, but he's right in there trying to help Australian in this, in this crisis. So, you know, trade unionists, social activists, they're, they're hugely important, but you're the most important. Your voice is the most important. And, and on that note, um, thank you all for being part of this discussion, because this is our little part of trying to create a space to share some of these ideas. And thank you to Phil and Sharon for giving up your time, particularly 
your sleeping time, Sharon, um, today. Um, we're here every day at lunchtime, um, not on the weekends, obviously, but tomorrow we are looking at food. Monday, we're looking at housing. Next week, Tuesday, we'll have our political geek fest with Catherine Murphy and the Essential Poll. And Wednesday, um, Emma Dawson from Per Capita is going to be talking to Jim Chalmers. So that'll be a fantastic discussion as well. So you're on the list now. You can't get off it. You'll be getting invites if you've registered today to, to come in whenever you, you feel the urge. And I like to see, think that you'll keep being part of this community. So that's our hour up. Um, so thanks all for being part of it. Um, what do we always say? Stay high, stay safe, stay home and stay connected and we'll see you next time. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Peter. Thank Peter. you, Phil. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys.